Hey everyone. Hello, hello. It's Irene and Seth. And we're here to answer some really good questions that were submitted um, into email all around Smart Body, Smart Mind. And really, I think most of them are asking, you know, will the program help? In various ways, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So um, as we get people on here live, should we chat a little bit about what SPSM is? And, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, because there might be some of you who are really new to me, I want to do a real quick origin story of what Smart Body, Smart Mind is, how it was created, and then we'll get into the questions that were submitted. If you have a question live, that's what the chat is for. We will do our best to get to the chat questions. And one of our main uh, staff team members, Mara, is here to type answers and provide links. So hello, Mara. Thank you for being here on the other side of uh, North America. Um, and here's where I want to start. So my world before the, all this online stuff was in private practice. Um, seeing people, working with people in the guise of working with the body, the mind, the nervous system, pain, anxieties, chronic uh, syndromes, we would call them, like IBS, Crohn's, migraines, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, autoimmune. Um, well, it's about all the mental, emotional things. Everything. Anxiety, depression, I mean, trauma. Yeah touches and influences so yeah. much. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and so what was happening in this world of my private practice was it was very clear that it wasn't enough for someone to just see me for one hour a week. And many of my clients were seeing me one hour a week, one session a week for up to five years. Now this doesn't mean they weren't making some progress. And this doesn't mean I wasn't doing my job because they had to kept, keep coming back. It just showed how much more they needed to help learn how to regulate and rewire their nervous system and essentially heal from the traumas of their, their childhood accidents, surgeries, life. And so what I started doing is I started sending them home with homework. I started sending them home with audio recordings. I would hold and host workshops. Um, theory in my office, we jam, you know, 30, 50 people into my little office and I do the PowerPoint thing and teach about the biology of stress and the nervous system. And bear in mind, this was back in 2012, 2013, 2014, even when I was still um, living outside of Vancouver, it, even in 2011 and 2010, I was holding workshops in the town I was living in. So one thing led to another and I amassed this collection of content and theory and exercises that I thought I should put this into something that is a course. And at that exact time, the internet and online courses were just, just starting to happen. So somewhere around 2012 through 2014, I really started putting my information, which is from the works of the Feldenkrais Method, Somatic Experiencing, this is the work of Peter Levine, Somatic Practice, the work of Kathy Kane, and then Somatic Resilience and Regulation, which is the combined work of Kathy Kane and Steve Terrell. Um, those last four people, um, three people I should say, Levine, Kane, and Terrell are all within the trauma space working with the body, working with early trauma, developmental trauma, shock trauma, all the traumas, and helping the body get out of survival stress. So I wanted to give that little brief background just so you know that I was working with people one-on-one -on -one for many years. I've been working with people since 1997 in some capacity. And Smart Body, Smart Mind that is currently open for registration right now until Thursday. So if you're watching this live, the 22nd of Feb is the final day to get in. If you're watching this some other time, just head to our websites to see when we open up registration again. For this year, it would probably be in October, late September. So if you're here now and you're keen and interested, but you're still not sure, definitely keep watching and listening. Um, anything you want to add about this online world and mm. Nervous well, system before we get into the sure. questions. Well, one of the one of the cool things to know about this work is that 
a lot of it can be self-directed. And in fact, for many of us who have early trauma, um, it may be actually much easier and more effective to be self-directed, at least for a time, because one, social engagement can feel scary, including with a therapist. Um, there may be a tendency to like need to perform to meet the therapist's expectations. We've heard lots of stories of that, of people who got re-traumatized trying to meet the demands of their therapist. Um, there's a lot of great therapists out there, a lot of great somatic practitioners. There's also a lot that aren't so great. So you're kind of rolling the dice a bit when you go that route, and, and it can be great. But when you have this education and the solid practices online first that you learn through your own self-study at your own pace, in the safety of your own home, right, in privacy, hopefully you have a safe living environment, that's pretty important to do this work. When you have that stuff online first, it can make you way more informed about what to look for in a, in a practitioner if you need one. Yeah. There's a lot of people who get all they need just from doing the online work, applying themselves diligently to it, bringing it into their lives. There's some people who combine that with uh, some form of therapy or somatic practice uh, with a practitioner. So there's lots of ways to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting these foundations and practices on board first uh, we find is really, really effective in supporting whatever comes next. Yeah. yeah. And if I even think about some of our colleagues who have gone in to do what we do professionally, um, they have said if it wasn't for going through Smart Body, Smart Mind, they would have been lost in their mm -hmm. trauma trainings. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that there isn't good stuff that occurs in these somatic trauma trainings, but they're not meant for personal development. So if you go into a uh, training or if you even go into working in a more intense so, sort of retreat setting, um, if you don't have some foundations on and some know-how about what goes on in your system, this can lead to, and it's going to sound dramatic, but it can lead to disaster. And we have heard over the many years, and even just in one of our alumni panels, I can't remember which one it was, or maybe it was last week's Q&A, there were some people that said that they got more dysregulated in working with a practitioner in the somatic yeah. healing arts. This is more common than we realize. And the thing is, is a lot of times the, the student, the client, they think it's their fault because they went and they did this piece of emotional work or anger work or shame work, and then their system crashes and they think maybe that's what's supposed to happen, but it's a sign that there wasn't enough foundational building and titration. And what, and I have some questions here about the outline of how the course works. We'll do a quick outline of how sure. it works and then we'll dive into the, the real bulk of the questions. Um, the way that Smart Body, Smart Mind has been created, and this was the first online course that I created. I know many people have done the 21 day nervous system tune up. This is a wonderful way to start. If I were to choose the program, that even the person with the most complex trauma has, I would always say, start with smart body, smart mind. And the reason why is smart body, smart, smart body, smart mind, SBSM, it works with all of the layers of the body, the stress organs, the kidneys, the adrenals, the brainstem, the gut, the vagus nerve, anger, um, healthy aggression, movement, breath. We do some, some very, very sophisticated breath work that isn't breath work. There's also really deep support and opportunity to ask questions um, that is not within uh, 21 days to the degree that is in SBSM. Someone asked, when are the times of our live calls? So the first thing to know, you do not need to attend live to go through Smart Body, Smart Mind. The way that the internet works is we're all in different time zones. So our calls will not be possible for a lot of people who are on the other side of the planet, say in Australia, New Zealand, unless you get up really early in the morning. Um, but for instance, my training calls typically fall at 11 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. And Seth's Q&A calls, he does the Q&A mm -hmm. calls. They're always on Thursdays, either at 10 a.m. or 3 p.m. Pacific. So there's a little variety there, but everything is recorded everything is transcribed you can have the audio or the video and they live on the site for you forever and you can download everything you can download yeah. everything to your hard drive so many people have never attended a live call mm -hmm. um and yet they have massive benefit because you don't need us live like we are right now yeah. for those live. <laughs> you don't need us live to learn 
right? If you go to a university, you're learning from a textbook that's maybe been written 10 years before or even before. You might have a lecture to go through, but all the information is categorized within that, say, textbook or manual. Um, so that's the, the answer to that question. Um, the other thing that people often ask is, um, what if I can't keep up with the program? And this is typical, this is normal. We want you to go at your own pace. We have resources within the program teaching you how to go at your own pace. And this is one of the trickiest, toughest things for us in modern society to understand is that we can go at our own pace. It's not like school where if you don't get your homework done at the end of the week, you fail, you know, or you get detained or you these things. It doesn't work like that. The content is there for you to take in. And if you watch and listen to some of our alumni speak, they will say over and over again, that was the beauty of this, this system that mm -hmm. we've created. It isn't something you have to get done in 12 weeks. We call it 12 weeks because there's 12 active weeks of curriculum. Um, and within that, there's two rest weeks. So there's really 10 active modules yeah. um, over the course of this. There's 36 lessons. There's nine training calls with me and 18 is that correct? 18, no, no. nine. <laughs> I was thinking 10 and three, nine Q and A's with Seth. And then there's a whole bunch of other resources that I won't get into completely now. It's all on the site for you to learn and learn and go through. Um, shall we get into some of the questions? Sure, yeah. All right. So we'll, we're going to a, another screen here. That's why we're looking away, everyone. Do you want to read this one out first, Seth? Sure. Uh, I have deep abdominal scar tissue from an operation at birth. It's affected me for over 30 years. Initially got severe after trauma in my late teens. I've, I've used Barnes MFR, a huge number of other modalities, all of which have worked, including something called scar works, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. I have had many deep emotional releases. The pain persists, but is getting better a bit at a pretty slow pace. I'm on the fence about SBSM. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as someone, I didn't have an operation at birth, but I've had many operations and I have many scars. Seth can yeah. attest to that. Um, the scar work sometimes needs manual work. As you said, I've been using myofascial release. So keep doing that. I will also say this. If there is still, and I'm going to wage a bet that there's still early trauma from that birth operation or that operation at birth, then SVSM will definitely help with that. Um, and the reason why is at birth, it's pre-verbal. So we're not making cognitive sense of the world. Everything we sense is feeling, is sensation, is somatic. And so when we've had something like an operation at birth, our system will go into some form of survival stress, probably some form of freeze, functional freeze. And when we're living in freeze, and this is nothing to be ashamed with, I was living in functional freeze my entire life up until just a few years ago. Um, our system, our tissues, they don't heal as well. Um, the, 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 the repair of the system won't be as good the tautness of the tissues will, will just be more taut. Um, and we want to make sure that we're also addressing the underlying stress physiology that was maybe, I'm going to say most likely, embedded in your system when you were really young. Um, and you've said, I've had many deep emotional releases, so that's wonderful. But you say the pain persists and it's getting a bit better, so that's good too. So the other thing with SPSM, it's, it's designed to help build capacity of the entire body, not just one area. And so when we gain more capacity, when we gain more capacity to, we would say, pendulate and move our focus to other areas, it also starts to shift the pain responses. Um, I actually did a, a, a live stream on Instagram just last week, and we're hoping to get it up on YouTube, hopefully today even, on pain. And it really dives into how and why SBSM can work with pain and why many of our alumni will say that their pain has completely shifted. Or if they do still have pain, they know how to be with that pain in a way that's healthy. This is really important healthy as opposed to shutting it down or getting more activated. Anything you want to add to that? Well, you, I mean, you said it already, but to sum up, I guess it, it depends on 
what is still lingering in your system that may be preventing it from healing fully. It sounds like you're doing good work already. One thing to note is that while emotional releases, deep emotional releases are important and part of this work, it's the, that's a difference between that and getting regulated. Now, sometimes that's part of getting regulated, getting those old charges out of the system. Uh, but there is more to it than that. And it involves not just the internal experience, it involves how you relate to the outside, the environment, and how that connects into the inside. So there's regulation is a multifaceted thing that takes a lot of different sort of ways in. So with this early trauma, having a surgery at birth, yeah, it very well may be that there's underlying nervous system states that need to be addressed as well as the physical scar tissue itself. Um, so if that's the case, then absolutely, yes, it will be helpful. Cool. There's so many good questions in the chat. So. I know, I know. Can we go back and forth? Or? We, we could. Let's do that. There was one right at the top that was really good. Okay. Well, they're all good. Yeah. Um, how far at the top do you remember? Are there? Yep. Yep. Okay. You read the ones. Sure. And they pretty much go together. Okay. I'm curious about specific spiritual practices, practices in your work. When you grow capacity and regulation, would that not make the spiritual practices better suited for an individual to explore? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then is there a curiosity for you, Irene, or Seth, to dive into plant medicine journeys, cathartic breath work practices, now that you have regulation and can hold more intensity? So first off, absolutely. And I started off with spiritual practices before I found trauma work. And what that what happened is I went the old route, what we call spiritual bypassing, or maybe more accurately, somatic bypassing, because the spiritual practices enabled me to just be unaware of what was happening in my body and to have it feel transcendent, uh, which actually you know, was nice, but did nothing at all to heal my trauma and the deeper stuff. So yes, when you grow capacity and regulation, when you get more uh, in your physiology, in your mammalianness, uh, in your animalness, paradoxically, that enables for a much stronger foundation for spiritual practice that's actually embodied. It's, it's actually in the connection to the ground, in connection to the environment, and not like disconnected in some kind of etheric state. And it's much more useful, in my opinion, to have that solid foundation. In terms of the second part, uh, diving into plant medicines, cathartic breathwork practices, now that we have more regulation, there's no need. No. I mean, there's... It, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, the point of plant medicine, in, in my opinion, as someone who has a background in shamanistic practices and has done lots of plant medicine is to reveal what the system is holding. Mm -hmm. There can be some processing that happens too, but it, what's important to note is when processing happens in an altered state, that is not enough. It will also need to happen in a sober state mm -hmm. because that's how we spend most of our time, right? That, that processing needs to happen in a day-to-day -day kind of environment. So plant medicines are great for opening stuff up and uncovering stuff that the system is holding. But when you're regulated, you've done that already. Like there's nothing more to uncover. No. So, I mean, it, it, and if it was to sort of go to advanced consciousness, well, sober meditation is actually much more useful for that. Um, and which is very advanced and does require a solid foundation in nervous system health and regulation. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's no need for catharsis or, or plant medicine once you're regulated because you're just healthy. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and you know, I think I talked about this a little while ago when I was talking about meditation and why I don't believe children, kids should learn how to meditate. Um, they're meant to play, they're meant to move, they're meant to express at, at that point in their life. They're not advanced enough for that. Um, and I kind of posed the question, why are we so hung up on having to say that we do this? Mm. And right now, um, I'm not sure what it is, but it's like, to join the cool people, we have to say that we've gone to a, an ayahuasca retreat or we've done microdosing or we're going to the, the big the big breathwork, cold plunge, you know, extravaganza weekend workshop. And again, everybody can do what they wish to do, but we've worked with this stuff enough to just know that as Seth said, it's not necessary. And the other thing is in a lot of these situations, you don't know who's guiding you and you don't know who's gonna be there. Um, and so recently, I just, today, actually, we released an interview with one of our mm -hmm. alumni. Her name is Jerrica. I really recommend people watch and listen to that because it shows um, 
what happens when you just just <laughs> when you just do really good nervous system work at least via the curriculum i've created sbsm which is what she did and everything shifted for her in eight months and she's younger and healthier so i think that's why her shifts were a lot faster mm -hmm. um but she lived in that world of the catharsis yeah. the, the the plant medicines i mean christ she lives in austin yeah. texas where it's like yeah. the capital of that yeah. and she now sees people who keep going to these workshops hoping for something different to change and, and nothing's changing yeah. um so that's you know our work doesn't have that that label that looks really cool in the same way that it might say to oh I went and you know to Peru for five weeks to do this, um, but it's not cathartic. It's it's yeah. honestly it can people have said it's kind of boring. Yeah, <laughs> the nervous system is extremely delicate and refined and complex. When we're working with it, we're doing the really effective stuff is usually quite subtle. And it's something that builds over time and consistent practice. It's not really about catharsis. Mm -hmm. All right, should we get to this one? Sure. I'll read it out. And then yep. we can, I think there's a, there's a lot here. So mm -hmm. I noticed that a lot of Irene's work, wonderful and successful work, is with healing physical ailments, stuckness, pain, syndromes. I do, I do not have a mental health condition, but I have struggled all my life as a result of extreme emotional and physical abuse at the hands of both parents being cast as the family scapegoat. This trauma was lifelong up to my age of 69 when I went no contact with them. So first of all, that's really good. Yeah. Um, I never belonged anywhere and I have no friends. I was always acutely aware of this since early childhood. I've been married twice to an abusive, to abusive partners. My only child disowned me 10 years ago as a result of allowing her to suffer so much trauma while growing up. I was totally oblivious to her need for more than my mere physical nurturing presence. I dread each day I wake up and I'm still here. I cannot see any reason for my existing, unfortunately. And then you write in quotes, unfortunately, I have good genes. My father, 100 and mother, 96 years old. Mm -hmm. Will Irene's course help with any of my problems, connection, belonging, purpose? So I'll start by saying yes, because we've seen this. Wow. Um, and interestingly enough, while we haven't published these results, about three years ago, we had a, a, an actual scientific study happen with Smart Body, Smart Mind, where a cohort of our students went through SBSM and um, the university uh, near us, University of Victoria's neuroscience lab followed and tracked. Now we didn't track blood markers or heart rate variability or any of the things where you'd hook someone up to machines, but we did intake questionnaires. And one of the key things that we found over just those 12 weeks was a sense of feeling more empowered, feeling less lonely, less isolated, and just more sure of self. Now, what didn't change were the people that had the physical ailments and the syndromes, but that doesn't mean that those won't change. It's because that stuff takes longer to change. And we have so many stories of people who have healed all sorts of things, all sorts of conditions that are physical, but I know that many of our folks find greater purpose, greater belonging, because they're connecting with themselves in a way that is, one could say, their birthright. And they're also learning how to connect with the world and nature. And nature has so much to offer, right? She's majestic and beautiful, and there's things there. But if we are stuck in a trauma response, lifelong, as you've said, we might not even know that there are trees outside that there's a sky, that there's oxygen in the air giving us life. So this is where this crosses over with the spiritual piece is as we get more biological, we start to find better meaning. The final thing I'll say, and then I'll let you get into some of this too, Seth, is um, one of our alumni, actually, her name is Mary Tulin. Um, it's spelled um, T-O-O-L-A-N. Mary Tulin, she specializes in family scapegoats. She was a family scapegoat and she is an SBSM student and we've done interviews. You would find it quite quickly if you went to her website um, and her podcast. And she has said time and time again, and she promotes our course because it's helped her so much that this was the one thing that healed her traumas from being the family scapegoat. Um, 
So maybe check out some of Mary's stuff this week so that you can just see that this is very common. Um, and yeah, genetics can, can keep us going for a long time. <laughs> but the key is if, if your genetics are strong, what if, you know, you say you're just about to be 70, you could have another 30 years and have aliveness that you haven't had. And a lot of our members are in that older part of life into their 70s, 80s, and they're doing the work and saying, wow, like there's grief that comes with that. You've got to grieve the life that you didn't have with regulation, but you can gain regulation at this age. Yeah. I think I covered it. There's Anything only one else? thing I want to add oh. is that just to, for you to understand what's going on, mm. because what you're talking about, uh, feeling like there's you dread each day, I cannot see any reason for existing. Um, I have no sense, you know, not having a sense of connection, belonging, purpose. Mm -hmm. All of that is actually is physical. Yeah. The root of that is physiological, not emotional. It's being stuck in freeze. Mm -hmm. The freeze response is what comes on when a mammal is preparing for death. It's the last ditch effort of the survival response chain. However, when you grow up like you did under chronic stress and strain for so long, the system goes into freeze because it can't take it anymore it has to numb out it's the only option it's not a choice it's what it's a survival adaptation that is physiological that the 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 thought and emotional content of freeze is what you describe if if a physiology is preparing for death what is that going to translate to in terms of meaning there's no point there, I'm, there's why I exist uh, you know this there's no purpose there's no meaning of course because your system physiologically thinks that it's about to die and has for your whole life. Mm -hmm. So this work is about coming out of that freeze response, which is physiological, which you can do. It, it'll take time, but that is what will bring that sense of connection and aliveness and purpose is learning to change that physiological state. And that's what the work is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My hunch is, your your system would shift pretty quickly i don't know i just have a hunch especially as you said you've got good genes mm -hmm. and and if you don't have physical ailments um yeah this 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 is this it could be i don't want to say easier because this work isn't always easy but the fact that you're here asking this question is huge mm -hmm. right so there's enough life force energy to be curious about healing this history and this past all right. Uh, do that mm -hmm. one. I was driving once and almost had a fainting spell. It's been four years since, and I cannot drive but very short distances, or that feeling of fainting comes back when I get too far from home. I fear fainting and hurting myself or someone else and being alone. I have a history of trauma, so I'm not sure if it is connected or not. I'd love any feedback on how the program can help. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Let's freeze again. Yeah, it's freeze. And, yeah. you know, one thing I will say is, you know, it is important to, if you can have access to get a doctor, you know, general labs, um, just get the physiology, the actual biology checked. Um, I had some stuff go on with my heart a couple of years ago and I had it checked and I was fine, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, but yeah, this, th there's something called POTS that's getting a little more popular these days, unfortunately. That stands for postural ortho orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Essentially, it's a fancy word for saying when you stand up, you feel faint and you might pass out, you get dizzy and you have to sit down. What's happening there is the cardiovascular system, the blood pressure and just the pumping of the heart and the chemicals that need to go online to make that happen. They're not getting the signal that you've stood up, or if they are, it's like flipping and doing the reverse. And that is driven by the autonomic nervous system. And so, as you said, I have a history of trauma. Of course it's connected. Again, this comes back to what Seth just said about the freeze response, right? The system wants to, wants to move, it wants to be driving, it wants to be out in the world. And then there's this mechanism that's saying, uh-uh, no right this is too scary it's not good um all these things um there was another thought i had it's left my brain um so that you know you ask would this program help 100 percent. 
people that come through this program, for the most part, most people have some form of functional freeze. Um, and we work to slowly take that break off of the autonomic nervous system. With that, there might be sympathetic that comes up and out. So fight flight will most likely be felt when we take the freeze break off, but this is part of healing the nervous system. Yep. Can't really get around it. The difference is when that freeze comes off and you start to feel the sympathetic, due to the education you're getting in the course, you will know exactly what's happening. And a lot of people that go into, we could say, you know, these cathartic practices that Seth was mentioning or other forms of somatic work, they might get the freeze off, but they haven't been taught what that means. And then this is where people go into this loop of thinking I've done something wrong because they start to feel what we would call anxiety. And that anxiety is actually the system healing and releasing the fight and flight energy. Yeah, or it, it potentially is. Potentially. Yeah, if we get what usually happens when sympathetic energy starts to release is we don't understand what's happening. And so we get scared of it. We think something's wrong. We contract around it. And that actually is what produces the anxiety. Like once we understand how to work with the sensations of sympathetic re release itself, we can actually welcome it. it, which sounds strange because the sensations and emotions can be ones of fear, anger, right? The sympathetic -y things, fight flight things. Mm -hmm. But once we know what's happening, then yeah, it, it just becomes, oh, yay, here's my life energy mm -hmm. coming back from underneath that freeze. So, yeah. The other thing I'll mention, a lot of our students will report that as they get more information on board and they start to work with their physiology in a different way, they start to realize, and it'd be interesting to know if this is your case or anyone listening, is they will, will they, say that again, they will avoid physical exertion and they'll avoid exercise because anytime they get their heart rate up, um, they feel panic. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that. That is maladaptive. If when we exert our body, we fear death and we think we're going to pass out, you know, because what will happen is the heart rate will go up. And if we can't handle it, one adaptive strategy, as Seth said, and as you've said, is to freeze, to shut down, to faint. So we want to work slowly to build up this capacity to feel our heart rate go up, but not fear it. Um, and this is so important for our longevity and just health of the physiology. We need to be moving creatures. We're not meant to sit here at computers all day long and not move. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing that you might find is that, that that urge to be active shifts because there's a fear of being active, right, and out mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Can I just chime in yeah. real quick? Because I saw twice in the chat something okay. that relates directly to what we were just sure. saying. Someone who was saying when they orient and they have a feeling of strong sadness, their lip starts trembling. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like they're kind of worried about that or wondering what's going on. That is what we're talking about. When, when the, that vibration starts coming through the lips, that's your sympathetic nervous system starting to let go. Mm -hmm. So you actually want to welcome that experience and try to just let it happen. Think about mm -hmm. softening the structures of the jaw and the mouth. And just it may, it may be that your teeth start chattering. Mm -hmm. right? uh -huh. Uh -huh. It may come down the spine. Yeah. That's your sympathetic nervous system coming online from underneath the freeze, which is happening because you're orienting mm -hmm. and connecting to the environment. Mm -hmm. So that's a perfect example of what we're just talking about. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that connects here, because there's a I saw a question somewhere around moms and feeling disgust. Um, one of the videos I did a long time ago on the importance of orienting is if we were young and whenever we hurt ourselves or if we had a painful experience happen, I always use the example of falling off your bike mm. or falling and scraping your knee as kids do and should when they're little. If our primary caregiver did not allow us to be on the ground and cry, and get that expression out if we were there's usually two things that occur one is you're picked up right away because the parent is scared and then mm. their scaredness makes you more mm -hmm. scared and you yeah. don't know what the heck is going on yeah. and then it gets worse and you never resolve you never come out of that activation of feeling pain right if a three-year-old has never felt pain in their life and they scrape open their knee that hurts it stings mm. right so that's the first example, not good. The other example is you do this and the, the parent says, you're fine, just get up. 
Yeah. Like, come on. And you, know, you, you pull the kid and they're like, ah, they don't know what's going on. What do they do? They freeze. Yeah. They shut down that need to shake and cry. And so what we want to do, because often people are like, well, what's the right thing to do? The right thing to do is to make sure, of course, the kid is safe. You don't want traffic coming through. But let's say you're on somewhere where no, nothing's going to hurt them. You just sit beside them. You don't interfere with their physiology processing. And what will inevitably happen after the ah, and the cries and the mm, and the, the anger is they'll look to the parent mm -hmm. and they'll then they'll want connection. And then that's when the parent hugs them, you know, oh, you got a boo-boo and you kiss the boo-boo and all these things happen. And then there's a natural regulation that returns for all the times that never happened. This is why we might start to feel these sympathetic arousals when we get more into the present moment, because when you were little, you wanted to orient, but you never got to. So this is how deep this goes. And you might not have any memory of falling and not being cared for that way, but I can guarantee you, if you know that the parent that you had didn't do the right thing or you have a hunch, chances are that stuff is stuck inside. All right, uh, next question. Is it possible to combine this work, which requires flexibility and sensitivity with the rigid rigidness? Rigidness. Rigidness. <laughs> can't speak today of schedule and demand of productivity for a full-time job. Any mm -hmm. suggestions on how to address this? Well, I, I actually wrote a, an article entirely about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you go to my site, <laughs> uh, sethlyon.com and to my blog, there's an article that's titled um, something like how to keep up your healing practices in the workplace and the world. Mm. Um, and it's specifically about this. So yes, it's absolutely possible. It may require changing a bit how you work because what it involves is bringing in some of these practices into your day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Now that may be as simple as taking three minutes to just feel your butt on the chair and look out a window mm -hmm. and do that bit of orienting and connecting to the environment in different ways. Mm -hmm. There's many ways which, which we can bring this work into the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I, I encourage you to check out that article. Mm -hmm. Another thing to know is that i mean i don't know if this is the case here a lot of our members aren't in alignment with their work mm -hmm. they're doing jobs that are survival based um, because they are already coming from a survival based place and and now they're in a job that sort of continues that cycle so one of the things that often happens as people get more regulated and more connected to their authenticity which is really what this work is about in a deep way is that they start to discover jobs and ways of living that are more in alignment with their just natural way of being in regulation and connection to themselves. So it can also lead to changes in what we do. But yeah, it absolutely is possible to combine the work mm -hmm. with you know a, a schedule and, and the need to be productive. It just, it may require a little adjustment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go have a read of that article. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I know of people, even people on our team who, found that as they got more regulated, they, they, you know, they can't, you, if you've got kids, kids to feed and a house to pay off, you can't just quit. And, you know, I'm mm. just going to work on my healing. You, you, you might need to find a way to coexist with that. And I've had so many stories from our alum who will then find their dream job and figure out how to make an income in a mm. way that's completely different than what society we could say told them to do. Mm -hmm. um so it's it's pretty cool and you can do so much when you're at your job oh yeah like that's what the bathroom can be for you mm -hmm. know like yeah, totally. get yourself into the stall like sit on the toilet not because you have to go to the bathroom and just like feel your feel your feet sense your breath you know bring your ipod or your your phone in and listen to a five minute orienting lesson or take your breaks you know go out to lunch and actively do some work mm -hmm. but you can be sitting at your desk, just like I am right now, feeling your your pelvis, you know, mm. sensing how your body is moving, working with your breath. We have to learn how to integrate this stuff because, yeah, life is life and we have to work. Mm. Um, but how do we become embodied in that job as opposed to waiting until the weekend, which is so common to let loose, right? Um, 
there's so much that can be occurring eight hours a day when you're working, um, even a job that you might not want to be doing. Yeah, yeah. Looks like they popped the article in the chat there too. Oh, cool. So it's just right in there, uh, sethlion.com, keep healing, world, et cetera. So. Okay. Um, Should we go back to the chat? Then? Yeah. There's a bunch in there. There's also, their um, oh, the yeah. team's putting Oh, they're putting them in here. So oh, great. We'll okay, nice. Check, we did that one. Maybe it's easier to look at the chat. Maybe. <laughs> I did see one here. Um, bear with us here, guys. Thanks for all your questions. Oh, I just saw it too. So there's been a few questions about nutrition and nutritional def deficiencies. I saw another mm. one. Um, that was around, will my food allergies and sensitivities change as we do this work? We have definitely seen that happen. Um, it really depends on the person though. Um, what I have found and seen is people will be able to better hear what their body needs and they will feed themselves based on biology and not what other people are telling them to eat. And this is huge. You know, we've got so much diet advice flying all over mm -hmm. the place, like a war zone right now. And the thing is, is that um, in my experience, at least in doing this work, people tend to go more towards whole foods, more animal products, more fat, um, way less packaged food, way less preservatives. Um, you will find that you don't even like to eat out anymore as you get more in line because you want to know where the energy is coming from. You want your food to be prepared in a much more holistic way. Um, and I always say, and I said this earlier, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting some labs done, some blood work done to see if there is a true deficiency. And sometimes there is need for supplementation, but everybody's different. And that's where you want to work with a really good, um, I prefer naturopathic doctor because I find that the general MDs just don't go deep enough into our labs and into our biochemistry. Um, in terms of food allergies, um, you know, there's a lot, I think, a lot of sensitivities and allergies that are related to bad experiences when we were kids. Right. So if you were forced to eat something every single week or or you were just fed food that wasn't good quality, you might develop a sensitivity to something. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't be eating that. But there's also stress. There's so much stress around food and eating that we develop um, a survival response. And then what mm -hmm. happens? The immune system hits up. Yeah. This isn't to say that there aren't somewhere down the line actual food allergies, sure. um, but we've seen just this explosion of them. Um, so I do think trauma is a big part. I also think just our food supply, at least here in North America, is pretty yeah. crap. Yeah. So it's... you have to be very discerning about where you get your food from, um, all these things. Yeah. Someone else asked about gas and like chronic gut issues. Mm -hmm. This all connects to the same thing. Yeah. It's, I, I had really bad gut issues for my whole life, IBS, um, that kind of stuff. And yeah, we can do all the dietary approaches. And if we're nutrition uh, deficient, we can do all the dietary approaches, et cetera. But the thing is, the autonomic nervous system is what determines our body's ability to, one, absorb those that nutrition. Uh, it, it governs which enzymes are being released into the gut. It, when you have a stuck survival response, fight, flight, and or freeze, there's contrary instructions going to the digestive system from a nervous system standpoint. So for example, if you're in fight, flight, that will send instructions to the gut to eliminate very quickly. Whereas freeze, everything stop. So you may have these contrary nervous system instructions, which can result in like, yeah, diarrhea, constipation, all these different issues, which can also produce chronic gas, Right? So the autonomic nervous system, which is what governs these survival responses, also governs all of our automatic processes. Mm -hmm. So when the trauma and the survival energy is stuck, then all those automatic processes also get into trouble. So it, absolutely, restoring regulation can change all of that stuff. It's not about what you eat so much, although that can be a yeah. factor, that yeah. can be part of it. Yeah. And it's important to address that level, but you have to get underneath it as well. 
basically when you become more regulated, you will be more apt to crave healthy food for you. Yeah. What that is, is for you to figure out, yeah. you know, depending on our age, our activity level, we might need less protein, more protein, you know, those sorts of things. I want to cover a 21 day question and also one on addiction. So someone asked, will SPSM help with hoarding behavior and shopping addiction and addiction in general? Yes. Um, again, I mentioned Jerrica. Uh, we just released her interview. It was really yesterday, but it came out today on email. Watch her interview. Um, she has a list of all the addictions that changed in her as a result of getting into smart body, smart mind, and focusing on regulating her nervous system. Essentially, addiction is a need to soothe, and it's a need sometimes to control, and it comes from trauma. Um, I just spoke with another alumni. We'll probably release this talk in March. Her name is Rachel Martin. And what's super cool is she's now working in a drug and rehab addiction facility. Um, and her the work she's doing with the clients there, the patients with this information on board is, is groundbreaking. And people are like seeing that what she's doing is different. But even her, she said to me, I talked to her just the other week, there's addiction in her family, fentanyl overdoses, alcohol addiction. She had trouble with um, substance abuse. And even her who saw this all in her family, she still believes it's not genetic. Um, it is a result of trauma and looking for that piece to soothe us. Um, so 100%. And then there's a lot of questions often regarding the 21 day nervous system tune up. And one person I saw asked, I haven't completed this yet, so you are currently a 21-day student, should you complete that and then move on to SBSM? And my answer is, if you can do SBSM now, do SBSM now. Again, as I mentioned, SBSM was the first course, and it gets into the, 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 the meat and potatoes, if you will, of working with the stress org organs and early trauma. Um, and so that you know, we can't cover in 21 days. The 21 days was really created so that we, when we weren't in active registration for smart body, smart mind, someone, you can do something. Mm -hmm. Now, one person said, um, for some people, is the 21 days enough? Mm -hmm. And for some, it is. Yep. The people that I've seen where it is enough, they have healthy relationships. So they might have a healthy partner. Um, they like their job. Um, they live in a safe space that's really safe and they are complete nerds <laughs> and they're self-directed. So they're constantly integrating the work into their life. Um, and my sense is they also maybe don't have as much mm -hmm. early trauma or shock trauma or freeze. Mm -hmm. So um, in my experience, most people find that when they go to SPSM, it just provides another incremental level of capacity building because we're working with the organ systems. And this is where the, the trauma, the sensations, the survival stress gets stored. Do you see one that you want to talk about? There's two about ADHD. Yeah, let's get into that. Yeah. What's the best way to support ADHD and ADD for children and young adults? What support is there for parents who might get too short fused because of the demand of that? And have your clients found this course to help with adult ADHD? Do you have suggestions? for successful completion if I have ADHD and struggle to complete things, mm -hmm. including the 21 day tune up. So first, ADHD uh, is from the perspective of this work, it's a symptom. It's not a genetic thing that you're as a life sentence. It's, it's a symptom of high sympathetic arousal in the system. There is a big fight flight charge and it's essentially saying to the system, danger, danger, danger all the time. So of course we can't focus. We don't even really have much access to this part of our brain when that's happening because the, the limbic system and the brain stem is taking up all the bandwidth. So it, we have to work with that sympathetic charge and help reintegrate the energy of that into the system in a positive way, which is what this work does. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. It helps with adult ADHD because that is just a symptom of a dysregulated nervous system. Now, in terms of how to support the parents mm -hmm. who have kids, it's the same answer. Mm -hmm. you, ha you have to do this work and increase your capacity such that the intensity of that is something you can genuinely handle. And that comes from 
uh, increasing your ability to be with your own inner intensity and allow those charges that you are holding to be released. Yeah. I would really recommend watching the parenting panel that mm -hmm. just occurred. Yeah. Like everyone should just watch that panel. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I was, this happened last Friday. It's also on YouTube here and it's long, but it's worth it. If you are a parent, if you are about to be a parent, if you have grandkids, if you work with kids, um, I'm just, I'm just going through in my mind, all the, it was all moms. Um, and one particular Kay, she's an alumni of our, ours and she's been on the panels many times. And she was someone who was, would say, you know, I had all the lab, you know, all the labels, uh, autism, neurodivergence, um, her kids had the same thing. And she's just, she had, she went into this work when her kids were older um, and now they're just rocking it in their worlds because mama has regulated herself. And that is, that is connecting with her grown children. This is what the vagus nerve does. This is what that social engagement ventral vagal portion of our vagus nerve does as she starts to shift her own physiology and get healthier. And she definitely got healthier. She has said she probably wouldn't be here. Um, if it wasn't for this work, she couldn't eat anything. She was on a liquid diet, super sick on strong pain medication. Um, and she slowly, you know, crawled out of this dysregulation. And in doing that, her kids shifted in turn. Um, and we just keep hearing this story over and over again. Yeah. Um, and the other thing too, uh, you know, we're not the only ones saying that ADD, ADHD, and a lot of these spectrum based disorders are trauma based. This is becoming kind of the common knowledge within the field of what's called the new traumatology. So the work of Besser van der Kolk, Gabor Mate, obviously Peter Levine, Stephen Porges, um, they're saying, and they're in that medical space, the way that we diagnose people is just not useful. Um, mm. They don't even use these labels. They just, they work with the system itself. So um, yeah. 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 Um, oh, someone I just caught tinnitus. Yeah. So someone mentioned tinnitus. Will this work help with tinnitus? So from my experience, tinnitus is due to one of two things. I'm sure there could be other things, but this is what I've seen. One is um, actual ear damage due to exposure to loud, loud sounds and frequencies. Um, I am not sure if this work will help with that kind of tinnitus. It very well may, but I do know that people that have had tinnitus as a result of trauma and dysregulation have found that their tinnitus or tinnitus, however you call it, has helped. Oh yeah, you had this. I had tinnitus really bad for, That's long, right. for years. I yeah, it. yes, and I don't I, anymore. I had so. a bout of it for about yeah. a week. And this is the thing, these are the things, these are the symptoms that can pop up as we start to regulate our nervous system. It is things rearranging, mm -hmm. right? Our gut might actually be a bit wonky for a while. Our sleep might be a bit wonky for a while. Mm -hmm. And this is that autonomic nervous system trying to find, like it's like this, mm -hmm. and it's trying to find that balance. Yeah. And then it starts to flow. But there'll be this moment where, yeah, it might be a little all over the place. Yeah, symptoms can come and go. But yeah, I had tinnitus for years, and I don't anymore. Because mm -hmm. someone I just saw tonight is, is from stress and inflammation. For a large part, yeah. yeah. And like Irene said, sometimes there can be physical damage to the ears. But for the most part, what I've found is that as well. Tinnitus is because the system is stressed, tense, and inflamed. So, um, someone has a question about long COVID. We just posted just, yeah. an article on that. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the actual question, do you think SPSM could help me recover from long COVID? COVID, 100%. Um, I have fatigue, brain fog, and memory loss, insomnia, bloating, and constipation for two years. I've tried so many things. 100%. So what yeah. we know, this is for long COVID and long vaccine. These are actual terms right now. Mm -hmm. The autonomic nervous system is being messed with. And so to work with that system, we can do things for say the gut or, you know, specific things. Diet, of course, is super important. I can't recommend making sure you're into getting outside, getting sunlight, getting your feet on the bare earth, um, all these good things. But you can I recommend what you can't I recommend. can't recommend sorry yeah. I can I'm excited <laughs> but no I can recommend all those things and and um this work yeah and um read there was a article just posted on Saturday I believe 
Um, one of our alum, Kat, shared her story and it, we actually pulled um, her story out of our SBSM program mm -hmm. um, forum. She gave us permission to um, because this was the one thing that helped. Um, and it's because we're not just working with the, you said, brain fog, memory, memory loss. In our work, the brain is an end organ. So the brain is getting information from the autonomic nervous system. And if the autonomic nervous system senses threat and danger, it is going to be on fire, right? And so what occurred with a lot of people with COVID is the system felt like it was dying, like it felt like something was drastically wrong. And so everything went into, we're going to fight this and we might even go into shutdown. Remember, everybody had tons of fatigue, right? And so what we need to do is bring up that energy to the system by working with all of these stress organs and understanding how to take care of ourselves in a better way. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add there? Oh, that's no, okay. you got it. Yeah, but many, many good things can help. Uh, and you, they should check out your quantum mm, yeah. healing playlist. That's a big part of recovering yes. from COVID and vaccine injuries too. Yeah. Um, is that quantum healing playlist. I think that's what it's called. Or, uh, yeah, it's like circadian. Yeah. circadian there's five yeah. There's five interviews with Carrie Bennett, Sarah Kleiner, and Corey Gasbini. And yeah. the other thing that's intimately connected here with COVID is mitochondria. Yeah. So th there's also some thought that the mitochondria are being impacted by this um, spike. And basically, we want to do everything we can to improve our mitochondrial health. Um, so this is where red light, therapy comes in again yeah. getting out into the sunlight um, making sure you have minerals proper mineralization in your water um, mm -hmm. just all these things that get more juice back into the cells into the cells and into the cellular fluid that is around the cell that's another really important one and if the system is dysregulated all that will have a much harder time happening Right, because when we're regulated, all those processes of repair and rejuvenation are way more effective. So that's kind of how they go together. Okay. Um, I'll tackle this one right now. Okay. Um, I know that Irene has studied Feldenkrais. Yes, I have. I, how do I bring this into the SBSM program? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Feldenkrais uh, principles are probably what what connects and brings this work together. So by that, I mean um, somatic experiencing, wonderful. Somatic practice and regulation, resilience, wonderful. Like wonderful, those form the backbone and the content and the theory of smart body, smart mind and 21 day. And of course, any private work I would do with people, same with Seth. Mm. But what the Feldenkrais element offers is how to guide someone to notice these things. Mm. So in SBSM, we're not doing tons of crazy Feldenkrais movements, because trust me, there's a lot of that stuff mm. in the Feldenkrais um, uh, anals, if you will, like judo rolls and handstands and on fours and all sorts of spinal twists. We don't do that in SBSM. What I do is I teach the nervous system components by inquiring, by guiding you to inquire and ask the question, how am I feeling my body? What do I feel? What do I notice? How do I breathe? When I go to move in this position, what happens with my breath? Does the, does, do the eyes get really tight? Um, so that's how I bring Feldenkrais in. I also teach some basic Feldenkraisian lessons. So we work with potent posture. We work with what I call um, rolling like a baby. We do some inhale, exhale movements that are classic to Feldenkrais called seesaw breathing or paradoxical breathing that really helps open up the chest cavity. And um, if you think about it, you know, the reason breath work when it does work works in addition to oxygen and carbon dioxide improvement is as you improve your, your, your breath and your cavity, you're touching into the organs. You're touching into the spine because the spine is behind that and it's a way to massage and get the, the vertebra moving. Um, and so the, the Feldenkrais lessons within SBSM are wonderful. They tend to go, they are towards the end of the labs because they're more complex but in it i teach the bell hand which is a classic feldenkraisian lesson for distributing tone through the nervous system um 
rolling the head, softening the head. This is what we use to work with the brain stem and the head diaphragm. It, it really dawned on me just the last year how critical that Feldenkraisian piece was. And it is why I think the program is so effective. Yeah. I'm not just asking you to sit there and feel your feelings ever. <laughs> I am actively bringing you into using what's called your peripheral nervous system through sensing and motor movement. And if we don't work with our motor movement, which is basically a fancy word with for movement, if we don't work with improving our movement and how we attend to that movement and have awareness of that movement, we're missing like 90% of the nervous system. Because what does a baby do to learn about their environment? They move, they roll, they crawl, they look, they reach, they grab. Yeah. And so if we're dealing with pre-verbal and early trauma, we have to work with the body. And the trouble is everybody's saying somatic, 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 somatic. We're doing somatic work. That means nothing if you're not bringing attention and awareness and attention to your system via movement. So I hope that makes sense. I get really excited about the Feldenkrais piece because it is one of the more unique elements to this online course. Yep. All right. Should we go back to here? Sure. Uh, these are all about breath work. Ah, okay. Um, so what's Irene's opinion about practices like 35 minute activating consciousness, connected breath work, uh, somatically releasing stuck energy, emotions, and trauma. Do you think it helps to develop nervous system resiliency and capacity by consciously creating a sympathetic response and then finding a deep rest in the parasympathetic? That's what I was taught. I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, can breathing practices alone help someone regulate their nervous system? Will the program teach us about how breathing practice and impact the nervous system? Um, I'd love to know if we dive into the subject at all, exploring the connection mm -hmm. between breath and nervous system mm -hmm. regulation. So yes, we do in probably a different way than you may be used to. It sounds like you're a practitioner and facilitator of breath work. Uh, you've been reading a lot about breath yeah. work lately, so maybe you want to... Yeah, well, yeah. so first of all, I'll be really bold and say breathing practice a lot practices alone, I don't believe they can regulate the nervous system. I'm going to use an example. So for many of us, we didn't get regulation because of our primary attachments as infants. When you have a newborn baby, or even a six month old or a toddler, and they're upset, or they're hungry, or you're not sure what's going on, but you can tell they're activated, would it work to ask them to take a deep breath for four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight? Probably not. First of all, they're not going to know what the heck you're talking about. You might do that as, a, as the parent to calm yourself. But if you were to do that for yourself and your baby's in distress, that would be neglect, right? So what I'm saying here is if it doesn't work for the baby, it's probably not going to work for the adult when there wasn't wiring on board at the beginning that was really good and solid and co-regulated and mm -hmm. attuned and secure. Now, could you use breathing practices in conjunction with a good nervous system somatic work that I was just talking about? A hundred percent. So in SBSM, there's two specific breath work practices. I don't even like calling them breath work, but one is Feldenkraisian based where you're learning how to expand the belly and the chest paradoxically. It's a very classic a Feldenkraisian lesson, but I teach it from a perspective of nervous system and SE and trauma informed. I'm not forcing you to get it as big as possible. It's about exploring the movement and how you stay present. The other lesson um, is about being comfortable holding at the end of the exhale and waiting for the natural inhale to come. And um, what I know and what I've been learning is that we need to get good at being okay with high levels of carbon dioxide. This is why a lot of the breathwork practices ask you to wait and wait before you inhale because you feel that, that increase of CO2. Now, if we have trauma in our system, we will, we will feel panic often. And then we'll, we'll try to breathe a lot faster. So we want to actually train a little bit this capacity to feel a little bit of that carbon dioxide excess without panicking. And that's something that I, I, I didn't know the science until just three weeks ago. Um, but I have that lesson in 
SVSM, and it's one of those ones that really teaches people to feel uncomfortableness and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is I have been dabbling a bit more with breath work through using um, a James Nestor's book, Breathe, and also a book called Jaws, which is all about um, malocclusion and teeth and why so many of us have terrible jaw lines and need braces. And what I have found is that by doing this stuff with regulation on board, it becomes a bit more potent because you're not trying to get an effect. You're just, you're able to better listen to your physiology and not override and not do too much. And I think what happens in a lot of breathwork practices is people are trying to follow the script, but they're not listening to their blood chemistry. One can pass out and have massive harm if they are not monitoring their internal pH levels just through their own biofeedback mechanisms. So we could be somewhere and we could be pushing and pushing and pushing. And if we're in a little bit of functional freeze, we might miss that window that says, you better stop this or you're going to pass out. Um, and there's quite a few stories where you hear about people that do breath work, they pass out, they're in a body of water and they drown. These are true stories, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be very careful, I think, about breath work. I do think it has a time and a place. Um, I started using it personally um, just in the last month to help with my lymph, my lymphatic system. But I can tell you, if I had tried to do this two years ago, it would not have made a difference because I was still in a bit of functional freeze. Mm -hmm. So I hope that makes sense. So I think it's a wonderful therapeutic and tool, just like hydrotherapy and cold plunging but only when there's more capacity and regulation on board. And the other thing that's important is that we're not trying, like Green said, we're not trying to get a response. You mm -hmm. asked about purposefully, purposefully uh, stimulating right. the sympathetic and then finding safety in the parasympathetic. That doesn't really work so well with more complex trauma because we can't push on the system when maybe it doesn't even know what it needs. Like we have to discover and build capacity and allow for these things to arise organically. And that's much more what this work is about, is slowly increasing the capacity through education and practical tools, such that when that sympathetic response is ready to come, it comes on its own. It's not something that's, that's pushed or forced. It's a very important distinction. So there's a conversation going here about breath work. And I, I know that because it's such a hot topic, people get a little frantic when they mm -hmm. hear us talking about this. So someone said, my upper chest is shut down in shock, feels like I can't breathe. What help you release your shock? So I just want to speak to SPSM. Working with the nervous system in the way that we teach will help release this shock. If there is shock within this, this chest area or uh, what we would call bracing patterns, like real strong armoring mm -hmm. because of survival stress, we can breathe and breathe and breathe till the cows come home, but it will not shift that shock. It won't shift that freeze. Um, so this is where the subtlety of the work is so important so we would work with that with working with what we would call the diaphragms and the diaphragm isn't just the, the respiratory diaphragm that's under the chest that moves when we breathe there's diaphragms at all these levels where um, we would say the chakras are but they're also actual containers from osteopathic traditions that hold energy affect emotions sensations and trauma and so in sbsm there are lessons related to working with the diaphragms where you are working with these areas with very gentle touch and gentle gentle intention and the results that people get with this subtle work it's hard to describe how much shifts with just this subtle work actually we just released a mm. old interview with janet raftus um, i apologize that the sound isn't the best on it it's when we were still using skype of all things <laughs> and uh, she talks about working with the diaphragms to help a frozen shoulder that was there as a result of a sexual um, attack when she was a teenager mm -hmm. and she had no idea that she was still holding in survival stress in her diaphragms and it's because she couldn't fight mm -hmm. off the perpetrator and so she started getting carpal tunnel and she started to get this inability to use her shoulder. And 
she could have done all the, the movements in the world to try to open up that shoulder. But the thing that helped was working or worked and to get this out and get that shock out was working with the diaphragms. Um, so she talks about how that happened in that it's a very short video. It's 24 mm -hmm. minutes. So I really recommend it. Um, I just wanted to, because you brought up the topic of sexual abuse, I had seen a question mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Kegel exercises and uh, yoni eggs as a way mm -hmm. to deal with pelvic bracing. Mm -hmm. it, that, that may be part of it, but usually uh, pelvic bracing has more to do with shock mm -hmm. and bracing that's held at an autonomic level yeah. as a form of self-protection. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so strengthening the muscles won't necessarily address the underlying issue. Mm -hmm. Very often we see pelvic bracing in women as a result of sexual abuse because the body's trying to get away from what's happening. So there's a, this pulling up. Uh, and so a lot of this, again, comes back to the diaphragmatic work that we teach. Mm -hmm. There's the system of diaphragms go throughout the body, including the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be that Kegel exercises is part of helping that, but there's also different kinds of work that are going to yeah. need to be addressed along with any incomplete self-protective action that may want to occur, like Irene was talking mm -hmm. about with Janet, she never got to push. push. So that's right. when we connect into the healthy aggression uh, portion of the work, which is about learning to find healthy ways to allow what's called incomplete self-protective response, where the system needed to fight but couldn't. Mm -hmm. So that um, often is connected to pelvic bracing as well. Mm -hmm. Pelvic bracing is essentially, I don't feel safe in the world. The, Armor. The, yeah, the, the pelvis is our, our root, our connection with the earth. And when we're braced and drawn up, it's because we don't feel safe to be here. And that can have a variety of, of causes. Mm -hmm. The other common one is called piriformis syndrome. That's where the deep uh, external rotators of the pelvis are also clamped and, and tense. That can be excruciatingly painful. And what that also does is it also can... Um, compress on the sciatic nerve, but it also can compress on the blood vessels and vasculature that, that, that goes into the legs and up. And so this is where one, one thing, <laughs> this protective survival response that Seth just mentioned, and it doesn't have to be um, um, sexual assault. It could be due to surgical traumas. It could be to just like holding in our gut because we're terrified to be at school and pee our pants. Mm -hmm. Right. These are real stories that we hear where people are constantly holding in their perineum because they don't want to go to the bathroom because they had an accident at one point. And so um, this is similar to when I used to work with people before I understood Feldenkrais and trauma, someone would come in with back pain mm -hmm. and it wasn't the back the, the symptom was in the back. It was in the spine. It was in the rigidity, in the stenosis. Um, or in the frozen shoulder, but there was a deeper message signaling the system to stay tense. Mm -hmm. And so what people will inevitably say is their, their body will become more supple. It will become more agile and flexible. It's not about it becoming soft. It's just about it becoming more resilient to move. Mm -hmm. And when we have these autonomic parts of us that are afraid and shut down, we can't get flow going through the system. The coherence isn't there. Um, so mm -hmm. having been someone who used to teach people core training mm -hmm. and, you know, sucking in that, that, that gut and contracting the TA and to help back pain, it's like, no, like, I'm sorry to all the clients that I worked with where I te taught them that it just wasn't enough, right? We needed to get into the whole system. There's two here I'd love to get just yep. real quick. Um, suggestion for empathetic, empathetic hypervigilance. So I was just talking about this on yeah. the previous call. Yeah. A lot of people who identify as HSP or empathic uh, in the nature of it being like a problem, you know, something where it's, it's a drain on us, but we're always feeling everybody and it's overwhelming. Yes, this is a survival response. This is when, when we're all em empathetic naturally. We all have the ability to learn and feel from the information in our environment, including other people and their nervous systems. When we grow up in chronic stress and strain, what happens very often is that natural empathy gets linked to hypervigilance. So it's like we have this watchtower always just scanning, 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 feeling everything and everybody as a way to try to stay safe. So the way to work with that is to 
actually learn to get underneath the, that signal, that survival signal, and start to let go of the activation that is making that so urgent. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a quick thing. It requires all the stuff, right? It, it's about regulation and learning to come out of that sense that I'm always in danger, because that's why that radar is so tuned. So, and then someone asked for me. Uh, can oh, you... can I just oh. add, just, mm -hmm. just for those who were here earlier and we talked about ADD and ADHD, this is it. Yeah, same what, thing. What he just said is exactly the same thing. It yeah. is a it is a deficit in focused attention because we are vigilant and looking for danger yeah. or we feel unsafe. Yeah. Yeah. So we're always scanning for threat. Yeah. And so we can't focus. Right. Yeah. Um, and then someone asked me what boxing has done for me. <laughs> I'm wondering whether to take it up or some form of it, but I'm afraid because of a history of physical abuse. So boxing wasn't something I got into until I was already fairly down the path of regulation because as with any form of intense exercise, you need to have the genuine capacity for it. And it's not about like getting out your rage. Uh, that's not really, a boxing isn't useful for that. To be clear, I didn't ever box competitively. I just trained intensively in it for about seven years. That being said, it was really, really helpful for me, uh, primarily not to like work out issues, but to just develop vigor, to develop a physical capacity, to develop my ability to move better. And that being said, it's also relational. So it is kind of a powerful, strangely enough, intimate thing that you're doing in sort of this, it's the somatic relationship with your trainer or someone that you may be competing with. It, I think very powerful and um, you know, learning how to defend yourself can bring a great deal of self-confidence. If you're just training, I think it's something that could be, you know, consider doing that. I wouldn't recommend uh, getting into any sort of competition or sparring or anything like that. But if it's working with a personal trainer, it can be a good thing to explore. You're just, you're going to want to check and see if, you know, what's happening. If you notice you start getting really anxious you go, or you start going into rage, that's actually not the best. It means that you maybe you don't have the capacity yet and you want to do some, some foundation building first. Yeah, and this will be a good time to mention, I haven't yet, in SPSM, we work with anger and healthy aggression through specific exercises. Yeah. Um, and we do those well into seven weeks into the, the program curriculum because we want to make sure there's enough capacity when we start to do these neurosensory exercises that yeah. focus on anger and healthy aggression, that there's some space for that big, juicy energy to come out. If there's no space and no capacity, it will feel afraid. One will feel, I don't know if I want to do that, yeah. right? And if we are questioning our healthy aggression, even if we know the intent is healthy, that shows we have more baseline safety work to do. Trust me, the, the aggression will come out in a healthy way when it is ready. Yeah. And it'll feel so good because it's that life force energy like surfacing <laughs> through. Yeah. Um, but for some of us, we need to take some time to build up the capacity and foundation to have that energy come up and out. And this suppression of life force energy and suppression of healthy aggression, anger, this is intimately connected with chronic illness and mm -hmm. autoimmune. Yeah. Um, and so for those that are struggling with these conditions that we would call, um, you know, more fatigue based um, where our system is very inflamed and, and very kind of thick and heavy and there's no flow, I would say 10 out of 10 <laughs> chance that, that there is a held anger and aggression in the form of this fight flight that mm -hmm. has been pushed down yeah. due to survival for so long and that wants to come out, but you also don't want it to come out until the system is ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to get to this one. Someone, this is regarding someone who mm. um, their finances are are challenged, and this is the case for many of us. So um, the question in general is, um, would it be more make more sense for me to purchase your drop-in classes and just start doing the work that way, or join the whole program? Is the com content completely different? So my honest answer is if you can do smart body, smart mind by a, the payment plan or you can, you know, you can do the, the full investment, I would recommend that only because the drop in classes are wonderful. But for mm -hmm. me, I 
I actually prefer my advanced students to do the drop-in classes because there's already some baseline knowledge and regulation. I do my best in the drop-in classes to put in little bits of theory, but you can only do so much in one hour. And essentially the, the SPSM program is building up so slowly and in such a titrated way, and you will get things in SPSM that cannot be covered in an hour long drop in class. Um, the other question, what is the community like in the program? So basically there are many forums. So any, any lesson, any neurosensory lesson that I've done has a forum attached to it where you can ask questions, where you can read other people's comments and respond back to them. So there's that. There's a general question thread for just general questions around your process in SBSM. And then we have two main um, uh, forums. There's three, but one's for alumni. Um, one is to introduce yourself so you can get to know where people are at and what why they're there. And um, I was in the, the forum the other day and we have so many alumni back. So it's great to see people saying I'm on round three or I've done this five times or I was here last year. Mm -hmm. So you can you can really see how people have progressed through the material. And then there's a peer to peer thread where you can pose a question um, or, you know, share something. And people keep an eye on these things. Right. There's mm -hmm. some people that will never go in the forum and that's their prerogative. And others, you know, they're, as Seth would say, frequent flyers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people are in there. They're asking questions. They're reading. They're cheering people on. Um, so that's the community. It's completely virtual. It's text based. We don't um, have live sessions with the students. So that's one thing to know. We, we keep things very much contained in a more online format than than in person. Yeah, I mean, we do. You do offer workshops sometimes, oh, yeah. which people attend. Those are live. Though. It's also different. important to note that but something that has happened sometimes is people will discover fellow students in their area and they may form study groups. But that being said, yeah, the bulk of the interaction is all contained within the mm -hmm. forum. And it is pretty a pretty good darn community. Like, yeah, there's some very supportive alumni. Mm -hmm. Um, just, just saw something real quick. Yeah. Uh, can you speak how men are told to man up and tough it out and what, how that can add to the shame around living with trauma? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I mean, it's pretty self-evident when you're told to shut off your feelings, you're disconnecting from yourself mm -hmm. and that when you suppress your emotions, you also suppress all other systems of the body. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And I, I, I recommend you go watch the men's panel. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, on Irene's channel, I led a panel of all SBSM men talking about this kind of stuff. So you may find some inspiration in watching that. Mm -hmm. And what's great is on that panel, um, we got guys in their early 30s mm -hmm. up to their late 60s, maybe maybe even early 70s. Yeah. No, because uh, yeah, Harvey was born around the time my dad was born. That's so right. that would yeah. be that would be like mid 70s. Yeah. Um, so that's the that's the other thing is um, you can't like, there's no age required, like you, yeah. you can do this at any age. The key is that you are invested and interested in healing and in improving in your system and so mm -hmm. this is the other thing is you know we are the catalyst we we are there to provide the information the learning um, obviously the live calls that we do but you must find a little bit a speck you know of inner inner agency to show up and and do the work of course if you're here watching and learning then you've got you've got that um what i will say is a lot of people will say that they kind of get a little frozen when they join something that's this big and it's a huge investment and then they sabotage themselves or there's tons of resistance or they procrastinate this is normal when we've had survival stress and we try our best to um, address that within our forums, within our calls. Um, we just released uh, on the site, mm -hmm. what is it called? Um, why anxiety, procrastination, and resistance might increase when we do this work. Um, and that's just part of the, part of the, mm -hmm. it's part of our learning and healing. Well, that's the thing. So for, for most of us in industrialized society, we're living in some degree of functional freeze, mm -hmm. which means because of the realities of our world, we had to learn to numb out at an early age for a variety of reasons, everything from subtle stuff to really overt abuse. It's the most common thing we see. When functional freeze, when freeze starts to lift from the system, that sympathetic energy is always underneath. So 
this is something that's really important to understand. As the freeze lifts, the energy comes, but that energy may not feel good at first. It may feel scary. It may feel angry. You may feel unsure. We may feel like we need to back away, like what's going on? That's why education is so important. That's why the first few labs or modules are heavy in educational content. Um, now, someone asked, if I can't do SBSM, um, what's the next best thing? Uh, probably 21 days, I would say. 100%. Um, another thing just to know about the financial piece, there's been a few people who've joined through crowdsourcing. Uh, that is an option for some people these days. So that's another thing to consider if it's if it would work for you. Mm -hmm. Someone said um, suggestions for fear of flying. Mm. <laughs> so, um, I mean, fears and phobias are part of what we hear about mm -hmm. from people. And, you know, we've heard people shift their fear of spiders, fear of flying, even just fear of leaving the house, you know, classic agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, flying is an interesting one because it is a weird concept when you really think about it, what we're doing in the air in this big metal thing. Um, we also know that it's the safest way to travel, oddly. Um, and I actually had some fear of flying a little while ago, but it wasn't because I had had bad experiences with flying. It's because my system was 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 popping out old survival stress. And so for me, it was less about the flying and more about being trapped in an enclosed space. So sometimes when we have certain phobias, it's less about the actual phobia. This comes back to ADD, for example, or pain being a symptom of a deeper issue. Um, the question is, is what is it in your life that maybe needs work on at the nervous system level where you felt trapped, where you felt um, not able to move, um, able to run, able to fight. Mm -hmm. And often we'll find that these things shift when we work at the stress physiology level. Yeah, I have. I also have an article on that, which you oh, may find funny. interesting because I had a, a, a thing where I had a big fear of flying come up mm -hmm. uh, and it was connected, believe it or not, to being in an incubator as a baby. So if you go to my website, sethlion.com, there's on the blog, there's an article in there somewhere uh, called Planes, Babes, and Incubators. <laughs> and it's about coupling dynamics, which is when various traumatic experiences can get coupled together and associated with other things. Mm -hmm. So you may find that interesting. Mm -hmm. I think we've covered all the submitted questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just scanning here. I saw one here. I cannot Please. breathe or focus without tightening muscles, uh -huh. including standing, stretching, physical therapy exercises, everything. Many diagnoses. What helps? What you're talking about is chronic tension. Okay. And again, that's a, it's fundamentally a nervous system state. The, the nervous system is sending out instructions for your system to brace and tighten and be protected. So yeah, anything you do externally from a muscular level to try to soften that will probably not work because that constriction is there for a reason. It's there for a survival reason. It's trying to keep you safe and braced. So again, it's about working with the underlying nervous system state. Uh, it, that is what's going to shift that chronic tension. So I just highlighted one here in the chat. I often experience that I tune into other people's nervous systems in order to calm down. I struggle to calm down my own system. Can this be some kind of a survival response? Mm -hmm. And can SBSM help with that? Well, what you're experiencing or sharing here is how we are built as humans is to co-regulate with other humans or other mammals. Mm -hmm. This is why so many people like to have a furry friend, like a dog or a cat, um, because they also have a nervous system. And this is where part of our vagus nerve comes in, specifically the front portion that attaches to our face. And this is actually really important. It attaches to our face, our throat, um, and our heart. So everything ab above the diaphragm, essentially. Mm -hmm. And when we have someone who we trust or who is calm, it directly goes through this nerve branching and it goes to our heart and it calms the heart down. This is why if you ever are in, a, as you said, stressful situation, um, people will say, oh, the, I, I was at the hospital, but I had this one nurse who she was so lovely and I instantly felt at ease, you know, when I was having this thing done, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if it was a procedure or something like that. So 
I wouldn't say it's a survival response, but it is a survival response, but we want, it's a good one. It's a good one to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's what you're explaining is just, that's, that's humanity. That's biology. Yeah. And, um, act, and it shows that your ventral vagal system is working, working. which is Super. huge. Yeah. Like the fact that you can feel safe from other people is actually a really good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. What I will say is we want to be able to feel safe without people. Yeah. Right. And so this is where, it's possible again i'm just speculating that when you were growing up um the person that you had that was supposed to teach you how to self-regulate didn't have that safety mm -hmm. and so um again just speculating here but if we don't have that growing up then we don't have good self-regulation so part of sbsm is to teach you not only how to co-regulate with other things in the environment. It doesn't have to be a person or an animal. It can be nature. It can be resources that are actually just objects. But then we teach you how to find internal shifts at that nervous system level via those positive resources. A lot of the course is you working with yourself, right? We're not asking you to journal. You can do that if you want to, but it's all about teaching you. You're gonna use your hands a lot for touch, right? You're gonna use a lot of focused attention and visualization, connecting, feeling, seeing around you. These are all things that we want to teach little babies when they're young, but for some of us, we just don't get it. So we're doing this now as adults. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, uh, just, I said crowdsourcing, crowdfunding is what I meant. Uh -huh. And so GoFundMe, like any, it's a, it's a thing where you go to a site like GoFundMe and then you create a social media campaign explaining what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, someone asked, can this help work help with depersonalization? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is another symptom mm -hmm. of, of, of chronic dysregulation, complex trauma. Mm -hmm. It's where we're essentially not dis we're not connected to ourselves or our environment or both. And again, that's a manifestation fundamentally of the freeze response. Mm -hmm. That that's part of the functions of freeze. When we're, you know, say we're you know, back in the caveman days where these responses were much more simple, you know, saber tooth tiger attacks, you either fight or flee. If neither of those are successful, you're gonna get eaten. You die. So then you go into freeze, which is really helpful because part of freeze is it helps you dissociate. That's, so you're not feeling the pain of being eaten. That's how these responses evolved. Now that's not so useful when it's something we've learned to recruit at a subtle level to deal with a chronically stressful environment which is what I was talking about in terms of our industrialized world. So many of us learn to recruit that freeze. Now that gets deep enough in the system. It's going to get such that, yeah, we, we're not able to connect because our system is basically telling us it's so, it's so unsafe that you got to stay out of yourself and out of connection with the environment. So again, it's the freeze response that enables that depersonalization. Okay. Perfect. There's a little there's a little conversation going about THC and, and gummies. Mm. Um, you know, I think this kind of comes back to what Seth was saying earlier about um, ayahuasca, plant medicines, and breath work. For some people, this stuff is helpful mm -hmm. and it's a good resource. Yeah. Um, for others, it's not. Yeah. And so it all comes down to actively and intelligently using whatever it is you use um, with an awareness that it's to aid you. But if we need something all the time then we're not in good self-regulation, right? We're, we're coping, we're managing with something. And that can be a substance, that can be television, it could be music even, um, it could be a person. So mm -hmm. we wanna find ways to connect with ourselves and find self-regulation, as well as finding positive co-regulating resources that help us when we need. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times people will ask, I'm not in a relationship, I don't have, you know, positive friendships. Can I do this work? And the answer is 100% because we're teaching you how to work with yourself yeah. and the environment. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know we're getting to the end here. Yeah. We need to wrap up. But just in general, we get a lot of questions like, does this thing help with regulation? Does mm -hmm. this thing help with regulation? Does this thing help with regulation? The really thing that can be tough to understand is when you're regulated, you don't need any things. Mm -hmm. Like you may still if uh, under acute stress, maybe you go to a resource, you know, you like, mm -hmm. but with regulation, stress comes in and then it comes out. Like you don't need to do anything. You don't need to do a breath practice. You don't need to have some THC. You don't need to do any meditation. You don't need to do it. Like it just happens. 
That's what regulation means. It's an autonomic process. So you don't need things to regulate because you're regulated. Mm -hmm. Along the journey to getting there, there may be things that you use to help. So it, it's a process, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I like, someone wrote, I suppose all the ballet dancers are in freeze all their life. You bet. 100%, I was one of those people. I didn't do ballet, but I was doing other sport. Um, yeah. So any, any sport that we Pretty put, much. any sport where you are forced to push and push and if you fall, you know, you aren't uh, you aren't allowed to cry and be there or you're forcing, in, in the case with ballet, your feet into these shoes that are not meant for feet, um, like point shoes. It, it's just destructive. I've worked with so many athletes, especially gymnasts, whom yeah. once they finish that gym career, their system just collapses. Chronic pain, anxiety. Um, it's pretty intense to see someone start to heal from a lifetime of being in professional sport. Um, and I would say many people don't get there because it's it's a pretty big process to mm -hmm. uncover those things. But I have done it. Mm -hmm. I can honestly say that you know it, it takes some time to move through these layers of shock and bracing and and all the injuries that you've never dealt with. Mm -hmm. But it's totally possible and what it'll save you from potentially is chronic illness later in life yeah. and we look at all these say football players who in their older lives have neurodegenerative conditions they're not well they're they're living with addictions um, and it's because yeah. their system has been in a state of complex ptsd probably since they were in high school football or high school gym or whatever it was that yeah. they got into when they were young yeah. okay Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mara. You've been awesome at getting to the questions in the chat. Um, again, just a reminder, the reason we're doing this long form chat now is we're in open registration for Smart Body, Smart Mind. Again, this is my online course curriculum that runs live in semesters, and we're starting at the end of this week. So registration is open until Thursday, the 22nd of February. This is a course that runs for um, 12 weeks with an added four weeks of moderation and support. So we go into June and common things people want to know is if, you know, they have to do this course in one go. No, once you join and once you become a member, you have the content for life. So this is something that our alumni come back to over and over and over again. This is the 15th time that we've run this course. So it's got some traction. It's tried, it's tested. We have hundreds of alumni stories and anecdotes on the site on YouTube here. I think there's like 57 videos with our alum talking mm -hmm. about their, their shifts, their transformations. But if you were to watch anything extra, if you want to watch anything extra, check out the panels that we just did, mm -hmm. namely um, the general panel that was last Friday, the men's panel that was last Thursday, sorry, two Fridays ago, and the parenting panel that was last Friday three panels um, that were just so great because it just showed what happens when you do this work consistently over time. Yeah. Um, that's everything. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Seth. Thanks. All right, guys. We'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Bye.